Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. 20 years ago, NPS came out and it was promised to be this incredible metric, the one number you needed to grow. And as it turns out, maybe not so much. There's a whole bunch of false promises. There's a disconnect between NPS and business performance. And today we get into all of that. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Welcome back to the show. Today, we've got a fascinating topic and an incredible guest to share this uh, topic with. Uh, John Doss is a professor of marketing at the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, uh, who's spent a lot of time on specific areas of research, mainly effects of price promotions, market structure analysis, and repeat buying loyalty. We're going to have a ton of links that we'll put into the show notes for you afterwards. But John, uh, today we're specifically looking at MPS as a part of the loyalty. It's 20 years since MPS really came out. Yes. And I couldn't be more excited to have this conversation with you. Me too. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is great. Um, v and I have had this conversation a lot. Hey, yeah. v, just about how polarizing NPS is. Yeah. Um, on one hand, it's like this perfect metric because it's so simple. It's one number and it's the number that was promoted really well, I think, way back in the day. The Absolutely. one number everyone needs to measure. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, I, there's like anecdotally so many little pieces of data or evidence or experiences I've had where you kind of go, huh, <laughs> really? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. what are we measuring yeah. MPS to do now? And like, it's been, you know, is it really doing the things we thought it's doing? And so um, I know you've dug into this a lot. And so yeah. we're super excited to have this conversation with you. Just to, to start us off, can you tell us about NPS in general, assuming that, you know, nobody knew about what NPS is, like just the general right. idea of NPS and how it's measured? Yeah, sure. So it it's it's meant to be a measure of, well, in some cases, uh, Reicheld, who was the developer of it, said it's a, it's a measure of loyalty. Um, and he was saying like the ultimate uh, loyalty test for a customer is whether they would recommend you to a friend or colleague. And so the NPS is based on a, 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 a simple question. How likely uh, would you be to recommend Firm X, you know, American Airlines or Qantas or you know, a MOP or whatever to friends or colleagues on a zero to 10 scale? Um, so it's a willingness right. or a likelihood to recommend question. And then they, the, the net part comes from basically um, you take the people who um, – gave nine or ten at nine or ten out of ten and you subtract from them the the proportion of people who gave you zero to six out of ten because they're supposed to be uh, what Reichel called detractors and so you take one from the other and you get the, the net score and you cut out the people who gave you uh, scores of seven and eight for instance mm-hmm okay Thanks for that. Because it's it's such a funny one, too, that often, like the math, on, and I know we'll get into this too later, but it's yeah. the promoters minus the detractors, and you cut out the stuff in the middle. Right. Uh, so, yeah. yes, I mean, it was it's, it's designed to be um, confronting. So the, 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 the argument right. has been, um, you know, from, say, insights managers in, in corporations, you know, and they come back on their report, you know, like our satisfaction score is, uh, I don't know, 6.2 out of 7 or mm -hmm. whatever it is, <clears throat> which arguably it's, it's you know, that's not that exciting. Or, um, you know, we've got 45% of customers say we're extremely satisfied or, or satisfied, which, you know, sounds good, but it's it's maybe a little bit mundane. Um, and, of course, most... Right say, for instance, satisfaction scores for most companies are pretty positive. You know, the, the average firm gets like seven, seven and a bit out of 10. And so the argument was, well, that's a bit boring. But if I, if I create this net score, which ranges mm -hmm. from minus 100 to 100, um, then, you know, we can have a, a management meeting and, and somebody can get up and say, like, we scored 10 out of 100. And people go, like, what? 
Like, my God, yeah. like we've got to do something. But it's it, it makes it sound worse than what it is because you've you've taken your very positive scores and you've you've detracted you've 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 subtracted the kind of well even some reasonably positive scores. I mean, six out of ten is no. not terrible, uh, but you've you've taken all of them out of it. So it it makes the score dramatic. And you can get a score like 10 and then, or six or negative 10 or negative six. And it's dramatic and you have to do something. Um, or you feel like you have to do something. That's right. It, 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 it forces managers to at least say, okay, we need to, we need to do something about that. Um, and, you know, un, un, unfortunately what that um, scoring method does, um, you know, converting scores from minus 100 to 100 um, it unfortunately, and maybe we're skipping ahead, but but and unfortunately, it makes the scores quite volatile as well. Because um, when you start taking some high scores and subtracting low scores from them, what what that really means is you could have a firm that gets like the same overall like mean average willing or likelihood to mm-hmm. recommend score of like eight out of ten, but depending on the precise proportion of tens and nines and sevens and sixes or whatever, you could get quite mm-hmm. different NPS scores. You know, you could, you could have yeah. this, the same um, willingness to recommend score of like seven and a half, um, but that could, that could result in net promoter scores of, I don't know, 25 to 55, something like that. And so that, right. that, that means the scores kind of bounce around a lot. So if you're a, if you're a market research manager, this is quite challenging because, you know, when the scores go up, everybody goes, you know, hooray, but it, it could just be you got a slightly different fraction of nines or tens in your survey, um, mm. and then they're going to crash down again next time, and, and you're going to be under pressure to explain why. So uh, it's, it, it can right. make it a problematic tool from the point of view of just consistency. Um, and this was – it was like noticing that um, because I was doing some work for, for uh, one of the Ehrenberg Bass – uh, sponsors some years ago and you know we were just reviewing some of the metrics that they used and I just I just was looking through this trench of data and 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 reports and noticed well, like here are some net promoter scores for this firm and some competitors but they had also reported the mean average willingness to recommend scores and I thought well why why is there you know like such a little difference in the mean likelihood to recommend scores aren't they only vary from like i don't know like seven to eight and a half out of ten yet the yet on the net promoter the 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 brands or the firms were varying like wildly by 50 percent and it was yeah. then i realized there's something wrong with this metric it's uh it's it's making the scores too um seem too extreme and too volatile huh it's fascinating um, I, before, like, we'll, and I, we'll probably come back to that in a little bit too, but yeah. I mean, just the sheer volume of people that have adopted net, net promoter score yes. as gospel is staggering to me. Yes. And I don't know if you have any stats on that and V feel, jump in here. But, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's something yeah. like, um, like, like they said, like two thirds of the fortune 500 corporations are using net promoter, some, something like that. And it's, Wow. It really is a case of like everybody uses it because everybody uses it. Like it's it's to their credit, um, <laughs> you know, Bain and Satmetrics and the other consultancies that that sell this, they they do a very good selling job. You know, if you if you look at the websites of of the uh, providers of this stuff, they they have a very slick selling message. Um, you know, they they make it easy to adopt. They've got all the you know systems to um, to track it and report it and integrate it uh, and so on. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's what we would say, it's got high mental and physical availability. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I, I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure about the, the usefulness necessarily of, of, of what firms are buying. So, yeah, extremely popular. And, of course, as senior execs move from one firm to another, they like to kind of take with them things that they're familiar. So if, you know, you, yeah. you get a, a, a new exec from a, uh, a bank or an airline or an insurance company that that has been using NPS, then guess what? That's what they want to use now. Um, yeah. 
but unfortunately, yeah, popularity is not necessarily a, a, a guide to um, quality in, in, in that instance. But maybe it's mm-hmm. it's it's worthwhile yeah. saying at this point, um, like it's not, like if if you're a firm that's getting pretty good net promoter scores, or you're a firm that has been managing to improve your net promoter score over time. I mean, that's that's not a bad thing, right? It's 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 fine. Right. Yeah, if, if if your scores are high or they're getting better, then I, I guess that's reflecting some you know increase in positive sentiment among your your customer base or your client mm-hmm. base. So that's that's not a bad thing. But the mm-hmm. the issue then becomes, well, there are a couple of things. If if corporations are adopting net promoter sort of on the promise that um, high or improving net promoter scores correlate with growth. So they're saying, if we can drive net promoter right. up, we will grow faster. The The evidence for right. that is like way less than um, settled. Um, and secondly, if you, if you adopt... NPS. The the implicit message of NPS is how will you grow? It will be because you've got satisfied customers, happy customers who will who are recommending you to others. And so it becomes a free recruitment. You know, it's reflecting you're getting a lot of free recruitment from word of mouth. But mm-hmm. there's like there's a big difference between people saying they're willing to recommend you and them actually recommending you. Mm-hmm. Because Actual recommendation yeah. depends on a person discerning that oh this other person could actually benefit from me recommending something to them. Like it's not as if I, you know, meet my friends for for dinner on Saturday night and say oh you know if I told you about my you know exciting experience with HSBC like pe- people don't do that. Um, <laughs> so you know it, it, it will it will possibly work if if the topic of I don't know mortgages or Banking. car tires or whatever <laughs> yeah. comes up in conversation but like it, it it doesn't doesn't really happen that often i mean i i can't think of in the last couple of weeks i can't think of anything that anybody has recommended to me um haven't mm-hmm. haven't had those sorts of conversations so so what that means is you know if you're if you're in an executive team and you buy into the the concept like okay high nps scores means there's a lot of people going to be recommending us, which means we're going to grow because a lot of positive recommendation. It's a it's a false yeah. promise because that positive recommendation yeah. isn't necessarily yeah. happening. Yeah, so this is what's incredibly incredibly interesting about about NPS, and I think when when we go back, you're, you're bang on, I guess, and when you think about like how popular NPS has become, you, you mentioned what two thirds of Fortune 500 companies are using in some capacity. Yeah, you see it everywhere. You see it, you know, on customer service sales experiences, you know, monitoring those product reviews. I have an experience where they actually used it for employees, yes. you know, and their ability mm-hmm. to kind of like uh, an employee MPS score. And, you know, for me, mm-hmm. th- that was very difficult because it was hard to understand within what was the actual performance. The moment that you start removing the, you know, the six to two eight, all of a sudden it's like, well, geez, those are great scores to have yes. seven and eight at least. Yes. But mm-hmm. we're also seeing it surface in annual reports. Yes. So, which means likely CEOs are looking at bonuses or being bonused on on things like that. Yes. Doesn't that mean it can be used in, as, or sorry, can not mean that it is an accurate metric? Good question. I mean, yeah. So, one of the studies that I published uh, on this back it was uh, last year, twenty 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 two. So I. You know, I hunted down a lot of annual reports for a series of, say, U.S. airlines, for instance. Um, quite mm. a few, quite a few U.S. airlines started reporting NPS in their uh, annual reports from about 2012, right. which gave me, mm-hmm. in some cases, quite a nice uh, data series. Um, so, yeah, does that? So, what does that mean? Well, you know, it means. In the annual report, we've got a figure of, of something like, you know, our NPS score was 52, and that's better than last year when it was 42. Um, mm-hmm. But the, right. so the, the problem is, I think, um, while these firms have said, you know, we want to, we want to um, have a, like an executive remuneration package, which is based on financial results, yes, but also some collective softer measures, one of them being, you know, a measure of, of, of customer sentiment. And at face value, there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, except for, I think, the inherent 
flaws in the NPS being that it's, you know, the, the way that the net score is constructed and the fact that it's asking about um, willingness to recommend, which is a potentially confusing uh, metric to people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I did notice in, in looking at um, annual reports is, they, in some cases, they stopped reporting it, and I think it was because they'd said, you know, executive bonuses are tied to a suite of performance KPIs, and great, you know, it's it's gone up and it's gone up again, and then we'll stop reporting it. And I wonder why we would stop reporting it, and the answer is probably because it went back down, but we didn't really want to tell shareholders that our net promoter went down from, you know, 60 to 40. That that doesn't sound very good. So it it it, right. it poses a bit of a problem for companies to adopt it publicly um, because, mm-hmm. you know, they, they haven't stopped to think that um, it's fine if we can drive it up, but it can be a little bit maybe embarrassing and um, what are our executives going to mm-hmm. do when, when their bonuses are tied to it and it goes down, they're going right. to earn less money. So unhappiness all around. Yeah. It's funny. They had a similar uh, example that came up a few years ago, but in the opposite where the company was l- shedding customers a lot yeah but their nps score was going up right and so i I don't know if this is true but it could have part of it could have been the volatility yes um but the other part could be just the only people who were sticking around were the ones that were happy and so even though and so (laughs) like yay everyone's high-fiving about the nps score going up but then it's not predicting the future growth because that is actually declining and so is that like, do you see that in your research too? Um, I I didn't see uh, specific examples of. Well, yeah, I mean, there was there were there were some cases where, um, you know, tracking the the NPS score over time and it would be you know drifting upwards, for instance, but the the firm's revenue mm-hmm. or market share was 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 reasonably flat. So in some cases, yeah, there's this seems to be a bit mm-hmm. of a a disconnect between between the scores over time and what's happening with with business performance. Um, it's most typically mm-hmm. been shown in you know in simple graphs or you know scatter graphs, which is what um, Reichel did in in the original um, well the article and and the book about the uh, one number you need to grow. Um, and you know he basically showed some simple scatter plots, which was the the NPS score on the x axis and firm's growth rates Mm -hmm. uh, on the y-axis and I think showed a series of about eight or nine of those showing you know upward upward sloping graphs showing you know firms with higher NPS tend to have higher growth rates but as was pointed out by some US researchers soon after that that came out they were saying but hang on in some cases the your years for revenue are um like later, uh, uh, earlier years than what the NPS scores are, and the NPS is meant to be mm-hmm. a predictor of growth. But in some cases, oh, the, the the data presented by Reichel, the actual growth was happening a little bit um, like before the NPS scores. Before they the measured same NPS, so, it, um, so yeah, a bit of a problem in, in claiming crazy. that it, it drives growth when, when it seems to be the other way around. And then the other thing that I picked up I, on was that yeah, um, wow. you know they claim to look at hundreds of firms in, you know, a wide range of industries, which kind of makes you wonder, well, why did we only ever see results for maybe eight or 10 industries and, and like quite a small number of firms? Like they, they claimed that, you know, they had a Bain team assemble data on like hundreds of companies, yet we've only ever seen the results mm-hmm. for, you know, maybe a couple of dozen. So is it that perhaps those, you know, those neat graphs didn't really work in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. so we've we've perhaps seen some selective like selection use of, bias. Uh, of, of examples. Maybe some selection bias. Yeah, I think so. Possibly, S- certainly something that that Crazy. shows that there's some more work to be done on on trying to understand the link, um, the extent to which there is a link yeah. between between net promoter and future performance. Um, and another factor about that is that it it, it does seem to be the case that. Because uh, I've been doing some more work on this um, this year, stitching together um, uh, willingness to recommend scores for um, firms in a bunch of industries in the UK, and I've and I've got matched market share data over time. Is that you tend to see like bigger established 
brands tend to get, you know, fairly kind of middling net promoter scores, but you do tend to sometimes see quite small new entrants with quite high growth rates. And they're also Mm -hmm. exhibiting high net promoter or high willingness to recommend scores. But I think there's a bit of, you know, important, you know, if you, so if you put all that together and, and, and analyze that with a statistical model, you could easily conclude, well, yeah, look, net promoter score does seem to be a, you know, a correlate of growth, but it could be, it's, you know, it's because there's a, there's a, there's a bias introduced because I've got some small new firms that maybe have a different business model. They're growing quickly. They're, they are doing things that customers really like, and they're also getting high net promoter mm-hmm. scores. But it's not so much right. the net promoter score is like the lead indicator of growth. It's just they're growing quickly. They've got lots of new customers who are reasonably happy with them, and they're giving them high net promoter scores. That's a different message if you're an, you know, an established brand in one of those markets mm-hmm. that's getting a lower net promoter score you know, can I actually even get it higher? And even if I could get it higher, will that mean that I can necessarily grow at that same fast rate? Uh, that's still an open question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, you know, I know it was a few years ago now, and I think this is kind of a little bit what you're alluding to, but um, you you did look at the correlation between financial reports and correlated back to, to NPS. Yeah. As a whole, what were some of those key findings that you had during that time? Well, um, you know, the overall finding was that net promoter scores didn't seem to be a predictor of growth. It it more seemed to be the case that they, they accompanied growth. So as the firm mm-hmm. grows, its net promoter score tends to be a bit better. But it's not one happens. It's not like the net promoter goes up, but then the firm grows. They tend to grow at the same time so that could be you know if i if i'm a firm and i grow and i've acquired some new customers they're more likely to give me a high net promoter score because you know it's a little bit topical like why would i recommend why would i start recommending a firm that i've been dealing with for the last 8 years as opposed to mm-hmm. well i've just mm-hmm. started dealing with say a new bank or a new um, insurance company right that, you know that's potentially something that i could tell my friends or colleagues about because you know it's a new experience for me so it's it's possibly that the growth drives the mps not the other way around but also um, the other finding was that past growth seemed to predict future growth better than what the nps does so you know this is a little bit, a bit of a flaw with with some of the huh. early uh, analyses of the relationship between NPS and growth is they do a cross section, but what they wouldn't account for is past growth, right? So you know if we say like here are some firms right. that have been growing quickly, does them does the net promoter enable them to grow at a different level to what they have done before? No, not necessarily. So so yeah, I found past growth was a better predictor of future growth than net promoter scores. Wow. So, so in that sense, if you were to say, take uh, a sales graph of a comp- company X over time yeah. and run a trend line on it or forecast 12, 18, 24 months in the future, that's probably a better indicator of what reality will look like than a net promoter score. I, th- I, pr- I, think, I think that is probably the case, yes. Yeah. Huh. So I, I certainly so wouldn't so be. Is, so strike one against net promoter score <laughs> yeah. for it being a predictor of growth, which is one of the original claims of it. Yes. Yes. I, I don't see evidence that it's a predictor of growth. I mean, you know, there are, there are, there are some studies that have been published that have been very, um, you know, like very technically well done. Uh, and in some cases, you know, mm-hmm. th- there are some that have found, you know, we, we, we construct a, a fairly sophisticated regression model and we try and regress net promoter scores on like next quarter's sales or maybe next year's sales. Mm-hmm. And in some cases they say, you know, it emerges as what, what they'll say is statistically significant, which, which you know, you can't argue with. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a lot of cases it's quite a weak kind of weak, quite a weak effect. It's like explaining, you know, maybe 2% of the right. variance in, in market share growth. So, you know, if I'm trying to, you know, forecast or predict my, how much better will my growth rate be next year, given if I can push my net promoter score up, like it's, it's really, um, 
it, it, it doesn't really help us much at all in, in understanding, you know, you, you've been growing at like 4.2. So will I grow at 4.5? Mm, 4.5 plus or minus, you know, um, a, a whole point or something like that. So it, it, it doesn't really help mm-hmm. you. And then there are other studies that, 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 that find uh, there's there's no there's no link so yeah really mixed evidence the evidence that that is there is yeah it's not you know, reasonably frequently. reasonably weakish yeah yeah um, so one of the other things that net promoter score promised the original promise of it was that and you touched on this a little bit um, yeah that a high MPS a nine or a ten somebody who's a promoter is going to give you positive word of mouth yes that's the idea behind it yeah. And and therefore the low MPS score, so somebody's a detractor, yes. would give you negative word of mouth or wouldn't give you any word of mouth at all. Right. Um so let's talk about does that. Does yeah. detractor actually mean that that did it does, from your research, can you talk about like what you found with sure. regards to that yeah. promise of it? Yeah. Um yeah, good question. So yeah, so what Reichel said was and, and again I think it's to um you know, I mean, if, if you if you go back and read Reichelt's you know articles around about this time and and the the two thousand and three book, like you got to be impressed with the passion. You know, like he was he was really mm-hmm. passionate about um, firms doing things to you know really delight their customers, um, which which is which is not a bad thing. But he he kind of just made this assumption that. Yeah, if people give if if people say they're they're not prepared to recommend you, they're giving you like two out of ten or three out of ten or even up to six out of ten, then he then he made this simplistic kind of extrapolation. Well, well, they're gonna they're gonna badmouth you. They're gonna give you negative word of mouth. Um, now that is just an assumption, um, and in actual fact, there's there have been several studies that have examined this, and they've found that that people who give low Willingness, low likelihood to recommend scores. They don't necessarily give you um, uh, negative word of mouth. In in some cases, there are a lot of uh, cultural uh, contexts and certainly market contexts in which people will give a, a low willingness to recommend score because they kind of in their minds they acknowledge that this is not something I'm necessarily going to talk about. Uh, it, it's certainly the case that um, Asian respondents are they tend to give low likelihood to recommend scores because they just feel like I'm putting my reputation on the line too much by recommending a firm to other people. Um, In some market contexts where there's not not a lot of choice um, or, you know, for instance, like in in medicine, uh, like in the UK, um, you know, people are asked, you know, would you, how likely are you to recommend your, you know, this hospital or this surgeon to other people? And, And people like find that like a confusing question because, you know, for a lot of medical conditions, you don't necessarily have a choice. It's not as if somebody's going to recommend a course of action to you. It's just, you know, like your doctor is going to tell you what to do. So yeah, in, in lots Mm -hmm. of cases, a low willingness to recommend score, it doesn't mean that the person is going to give negative word of mouth. And in actual fact, there was a, uh, there was a beautiful um, meme on uh, Facebook uh, that my daughter sent me just yesterday. It was, um, it was a picture of an NPS survey and, and somebody had been asked, how likely are you to recommend Windows 10 to a friend or colleague? And the person had ticked one. And then the question was, you know, why did you give that score? And, the, and it was written, well, I need you to understand that people don't have random conversations with other people about operating systems. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's why point. I gave a one. It's not because I'm going to detract from Windows 10, but just I don't talk <laughs> about operating systems to other people. Well, that was going to be one of my next questions is what operating system are you running, uh, John? But I guess we're <laughs> going to just deflect now and go in another direction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in all fairness, though, the, kind of like the third thing that NPS was uh, was kind of, well, at least it was per, uh, it was promoted that it's going to do a lot better for measuring customer satisfaction. Right. And um, have you found that there's any proof or to support that claim that, you know, uh, CSAT scores are actually inferior to what NPS's willingness to recommend is? Right. Um, 
Well, one of the um, sort of landmark studies, I guess, on this fairly soon after Reichelt's book came out, there's some some fairly um, well-known U.S. academic researchers tried, you know, like they mapped the uh, the NPS data um, and they got corresponding, you know, customer satisfaction data for the same firms and analysed it right. and, and found the, the NPS is not doing any better than customer satisfaction in explaining kind of variation in market share growth. Um, and other studies have, have done the same. So, no, there's, there's, there's no evidence that net promoter is a better predictor or correlate of, of growth than what customer satisfaction is. And indeed, like the evidence on customer satisfaction itself uh, is extremely mixed. Like um, there are some studies that have found customer satisfaction is a predictor of growth. But again, there are lots of issues with those sorts of studies. So no, um, NPS is not a superior metric to customer satisfaction in explaining or predicting growth. And so what I've found is they the two things are correlated so highly. Uh, they're correlated at something like 0.8 or thereabouts. So in other words, if you've got customer satisfaction scores, then the net promoter is not really going to give you a whole lot of additional information because, you know, let's face it, if, if, if a customer is, you know, um, not, you know, not very satisfied with you, then they'll probably right. also give you a pretty low willingness to recommend score. And if they're very, very happy with you, right. they'll probably, you know, from some sort of halo effect, they'll probably say, you know, yeah, I'd be, you know, I'd be, I'd be willing to recommend. Um, even though the question itself is a little bit confusing because it doesn't sort of, it doesn't ask people like if a conversation came up on the topic of vacuum cleaners, would you recommend your new vacuum cleaner to a friend or colleague? It's just like, would you recommend this new vacuum cleaner to a friend or colleague? And people just think, well, I've just told you that I'm pretty happy with it. So I guess to maintain internal consistency, I'll give a high score on willingness to recommend. Yeah. So, Mark, if I'm counting correctly, I, that's three strikes, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I'm sitting here, like, just scratching my head, literally, because, I mean, it's not a predictor of growth. It's it's not predicting positive or negative word of mouth. Um, I th- And your point is fascinating be- about how people interpret the question. Because some people could just literally interpret it as, as it's written, like, no, I'm not mm-hmm. willing to recommend you. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. give you a really low score. Like that's just so obvious that when you're in marketing, we understand the context of why we're asking, but the average person might just go, no, I'm not willing and, and, and give you a low score because they're just reading it for what it's yeah. the face value yeah. of the question. Yeah. So, and I then, mean, there, and so and is... it's also not a, sorry, I was just going to say it's still, it's also not a better question than satisfaction. So like, I cut you off, but yeah. I know I just am scratching my head. Like, what do you do with this metric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I so I I, I should say that um, like there is there is a there is some level of positive link between uh, willingness to recommend scores and later recommendation, right? But it's weakish but positive. So you know, if, if people Okay. do give you an eight or nine or a 10 or whatever, then they are somewhat more likely to subsequently say something positive about, of, about the brand than somebody who gave a, a two or two or a three, but it's a, it's a pretty weak link. Right. Like, like I think the majority of people who say that they are very, very likely to recommend don't necessarily do so, but, but some do. So it's, it's, it's a weak, but positive reflection of, of um, future word of mouth. I mean, my my feeling is that if you're a firm and you know it's really important to you to understand customer satisfaction
that much. You know what I mean? Like there's be specific, ask the thing you want to ask, not just some default question. Yeah. And I think that's like, that was a good push on, on your side as well, because it's, it's really kind of, what are we actually trying to find out in this moment? And language is important. So this willingness to recommend can be interpreted so many different ways. I could have had a great experience. Totally. But I'm still not going to recommend you just because I don't want to. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I think that's where I struggle with this metric and how it's it's used. And I have to be honest, like when we used it organ as a, as a way to gauge how you're performing in an organization, it was mm -hmm. the absolute worst because all of, all of a sudden it would kind of created this, like this mean where everyone was just kind of in the middle. Your high performers were all in mm -hmm. the middle. Those that were a little bit on lower end were still kind of in the middle. And it's just, you know, a high performer immediately was like, what do you mean you're going to, you know, you're going to take away my eights and my sevens. N yeah. No one's going to rate or, nine and 10. If you're, if you're being rated nine yeah. and 10, guess what? You're in the wrong position. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the industry that I've seen this in. Um, but it comes up a lot where, where oh, I wish I could remember. Oh, you know what it is at the service center at the car dealership that okay. I go to. So they always ask MPS and they always say to mm -hmm. me, we'll send you out a survey afterwards. If you can give me a nine or 10, that'd be great. Because <laughs> <laughs> the other ones yeah. don't count. It literally doesn't count. <laughs> like, yeah, they're, like, they're pr priming me to give them a nine or a 10. Like, and Eight. so, I don't know. Sure, I'll give you a nine <laughs> or 10. Yeah, like, <laughs> or, well, yeah. But then also, and I've seen this too, where at a past company, we were like, you know, 47 and everyone's high-fiving because at that time we we're <laughs> better than the competition. That's I think one of the amazing things yeah. about it, that it's reasons why it's so adopted is because you can benchmark. Not just against companies in your own industry, but also outside. Like you can benchmark yourself against yeah. Apple. And that was a thing That's where true. like, oh, we're, we're better than Apple at 47. But then the next one comes around. <laughs> It's 35. Yeah. Oh, flip the table. What's going on? Everything's just <laughs> totally the sky is falling. Like it could have just been there's less people that scored you 10. That's it. <laughs> Mom and dad didn't rate you this week, this month or this quarter. Right. Like I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I do. I'm a, I am a big believer in being able to benchmark uh, over time. Yeah, I just, I again, I, I keep coming back to NPS that I don't think that's the metric that you that you need to be benchmarking, and I think there's a lot more, yeah. there's a lot more of opportunity when you really do, um, mm -hmm. you know, really be thoughtful in the evaluative questions that you're doing, your CSAT, and and just making sure that you're being yeah. very methodical in terms of the information you're asking for to create those benchmarks. Yeah. I just don't. Yeah. It fails on all three promises, man. Like it doesn't predict growth. It doesn't mean if someone is a detractor is actually not, is going to spread, you know, poor things about you, or your service and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But even if you are on the opposite side, it still doesn't mean people are going to recommend you. So what does it actually mean? It means mm -hmm. nothing. And mm -hmm. what was the final one again? It was more like customer satisfaction exactly. than anything else. Like as far as it being correlated to anything, it's closer Close, more closely correlated to customer yeah. satisfaction. And just the way the conversation ended around like, hey, if, if you're really looking at growth, you, you're kind of focusing on mental availability and physical availability. Try to change the perception mm -hmm. and a consumer that doesn't know you that they, you would be a first choice once they entered that, you know, the, the sure. process of buying or looking up a service or a product from you. Very simple. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Well, yeah. I mean, so if it if it doesn't meet all those rules, and the one thing it's closer to is customer satisfaction, and it's and but customers customer satisfaction asks customers if they're satisfied. I would just just soon, soon use that. Like, I don't know why why complicate I'm, it. I'm with you. I think I think you did touch on something though. It is it is because there are two thirds of Fortune 500 companies are are using it. I would argue maybe it is a way to say, hey, how are we pacing against another another organization or the fortune 500 company we kind of have you know put up and maybe nps is one of those things that it's like oh look at us we're we're great uh as we as we continue to grow but i, I love that that he 
uh, how did he say it? It was more of a, it's, it's not a predictor of growth. It, it accompanies growth. So NPS can go up as your mm-hmm. company grows, but it's not predicting your growth. Yeah. And I think that was... Right. The, so just use your sales did, numbers. I, right? <laughs> like, what, he said it was what? Past yeah. growth is a better indicator of future growth. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Mic drop. Put your pens down, everyone. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like, I think it can, in real, to your point, it, there's, it can be a distraction, I think. But if you're in it and you're using it. Keep going. Like, I don't know if that's a hill I'm going to die on. I'm with you. But I think I would, knowing what I know now, I I might ask questions like, hey, can we track performance of like revenue performance against MPS scores and see what that looks like? Yeah. And if it, you know, and see what the numbers are and, and, and somebody can run the calculations or, or the same thing with, can we actually track whether people are rec- recommending us or not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, and then we can see the data for ourselves rather than it being told to us. You can see yeah. it and see where the value of it is. Mm-hmm. Because maybe you're right. Maybe it is just for benchmarking. And if it's, I don't, I don't know. Like I, it's, I'm just <laughs> up in the air about this whole metric and whether it's what use it has at all. <laughs> That's it. Maybe, maybe it's use. It's like pull it out of the annual reports. If you're going to leave it in annual reports, make sure it's more of a, a metric that you're, you're you're just keeping there to be like this. Actually, has no bearing on our performance in totality, but here's a here's our nps for the last quarter yeah like i don't know yeah there's uh, your example of you know the the company that was losing customers but their nps was going up i think is for me such a such a prime example where this metric doesn't work not even in 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 Mm -hmm. potentially predicting your current state because if your sales are down Mm -hmm. your sales are down you're hemorrhaging customers but your nps goes up that becomes a con- utterly useless metric completely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm getting fired up now. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. And here I am looking at this going, okay, let's talk about it. And, and I don't mean this in the in a bad way at all to John. I, I love the work that he did on this, but I'm like, okay, let's talk about something that matters. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. Not that his research doesn't, but that the MPS number is like I said before, it's I think ultimately a distraction. Well, I think but it's, a lot of people use it. So I guess it, it, we're going to have to stick with it for a while. Well, I would argue it's because of his research. And now we can start challenging it and start, you know, pressure testing it a lot totally. more in organizations. So like, thank you to to John totally. and everyone else who's spending time and, and researching this because we, now we have enough information to say, you know what? Yeah, there's not enough here to suggest that NPS is any uh, is a metric that we can be used to derive any meaningful meaning from. So cool, moving on. Yeah. Where are we going to focus our attention? And I think being totally. able to do that is great. First of all, it's a great conversation to have. But secondly, more and more importantly, it gets you closer to the areas that you need to be focusing your attention to. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I love that feed. Yeah. Man. On that note. Yeah. I think that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that so, I have anything else to add other than I'm just like fed up with MPS. Well, I wanted to pose this to our listeners. <laughs> Can you please rate us nine and 10, please? On all the platforms that we show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's only please up give to us five. nine or ten. If yeah. you enjoy this podcast, please recommend us <laughs> to all of your friends. <laughs> In all fairness, though, yeah, actually, please. that's the right way to do it. Would you be willing to recommend us to all, you to your friends and family and colleagues? There you go. Give us, please rate us a nine or ten. Yes, please. <laughs> And if it's okay, anything less than that, please. That don't. was good, man. That was a great conversation. This was awesome. Thanks, man. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. All right. See ya. Take care.